quiet morning here at the barn and I'm waiting for things to warm up just a little bit more before I pull blankets. And it's just so peaceful and it's gonna be warm today. And I know if I don't do this video now, I'm just gonna overthink it. And I'm probably gonna overthink it now. I'm probably gonna refilm this later, but I'm gonna overthink it even more. And I really want to get what's going through my mind out there. Um, a couple of things first. Um, I'm going to try not to include any of my crying, which I'm already off to a good start. Um, <clears throat> I've cried a lot the past couple of days. I've cried more than I thought could ever come out of my body um, and I'm not somebody that enjoys crying in front of other people which technically I'm just here in front of my dogs right now but you know and also you're not here to watch me cry I uh, I'm taking this the condensation is falling off the barn roof and onto what I'm sitting on anyways um, I'm taking this as a learning opportunity um, not only a learning opportunity, but also I just want to talk about my story with Elliot because it was a long story. Um, we were together for, together like we were dating. Um, we were, I mean, we were in a partnership for eight years. I am talking about a horse, not a person, by the way. Um, but you know, and through that, and with that partnership came a lot of growth through social media. Like you guys literally watched me and this horse grow up um, and do some <laughs> questionable things. Um, and I know through through our history, through everything that Elliot and I went through, um, there, was, there was a lot of things that caused a lot of issues through social media, caused a lot of uproar. Um, I was posted on quite a few hor horrible horsemanship pages and I'm gonna say right now I don't think it's ever okay to post somebody on there like that at the time really hurt little 15 year old me's feelings but the things in question I have moved on from and do not participate in anymore and I just kind of want to say it is possible for people to grow out of horrible horsemanship <laughs> But that being said, Elliot was there through all of that really hard learning for me. And he was the horse that I needed to teach me those things and teach me not to do those things and let me grow and find what I wanted to do. And he was there for me every single step of the way. So I feel like if I don't share his story and just talk about all of the wonderful memories he left me with, I'm not doing him justice. So, I also wanna say, I have to figure out how to say this. Um, there are a lot of parts of this story that I don't necessarily want to leave out, but I am going to speak very lightly about them um, because Forgiveness and, and moving on is a really big topic in this story. Um, but the last time I spoke relatively open about some of the things in Elliot and I's history, Elliot, my and Elliot, I don't know, grammar's not my thing. Um, I, was, I was assaulted um, in public at a horse show by someone who was not in a stable mind um, and that really, really traumatized me. Um, so I don't want that to happen again. <laughs> um, and is it is, I mean, it's part of our story because it is a big part of my horse show anxiety now. Um, but I don't, I just don't feel like dealing with the repercussions of telling the whole truth. <laughs> it's not funny. Um, and also, I, 
it might be my social anxiety, I don't know, but I, I tend to cope with these things with humor around other people. Um, like when I'm by myself, I just, I just cry. I, I look through memories, I look through everything else and I just cry. Um, but I, again, I don't like crying in front of other people. So if you see me laughing about it, it's not funny. It's not funny. This is just how I'm coping and it laughing about it and making jokes helps me not think too hard about it. But anyways, so <sighs> overlook of what we're gonna what we're gonna talk about here. And I want this to be a conversation because like I do want you guys to be able to take my hardships and learn from it, but also being in social media as long as I have been. I've literally been doing this as long as I've had Elliot. Um, I can, I already can pretty much predict the hate comments that are gonna come. And normally I don't care about hate comments, whatever. And you know, I already know what they're gonna be, so it doesn't bother me. But that being said, I do want to go ahead and clear some things up as best I can. So what we're gonna talk about in this video, um, I want to tell you a little bit, a bit about Elliot's story, some of the things I did share, some of the things I didn't share, um, and talk about where that led us and where we ended up. Um, and if you follow my Instagram, you'll, you will have seen me publicly grieving. Um, I appreciate you guys letting me have that as an outlet and supporting me through that, that the comments are just incredibly kind and I'm so grateful for that. Um, but I do wanna share a little bit more in depth about the results we got from his passing and how that played into his whole life because it's not at all what we expected. Um, that horse was anything but predictable <laughs> and he really held that out to the end. So, this is gonna be a long video, I already know it. Hemi, Hemi knocked over my tripod, hang on. I tried to set it up in the background, but this is Elliot's stall. My mom put this flag over um, his stall the morning after he passed. And of course I bawled on the barn floor for a while about it, <clears throat> excuse me. Those are his, I don't know if you can see them, those are his shoes. Those are the shoes that we, he was barefoot for the past like five years of his life, but um, those were the last pair of shoes we pulled off of him after the Congress. Um, and this is his halter that he wore. Um, and I'll explain why it's there in a minute. <laughs> um, so when I was 15, I had Foxy and I feel like everybody knows Foxy. Foxy is my old paint horse, love him to death. He's a saint. And we were boarding, my family and I were boarding the horses in um, a family friend's barn. And I had one horse prior to that. I explained that in my last video. Um, anyways, so it was totally by circumstance. I was not looking for a horse at all. Um, I love Foxy. We were showing, we were doing great. Everything was dandy. And I saw on Facebook um, this little two-year-old that was posted for sale. And something about him just drew me to him. I still can't explain this, explain him to this day. I remember very clearly I was sitting in math class in, would that be high school? I don't know, it was in school. And I sent it to my parents and I was like, look how cute this guy is. And he was only 800 bucks. So I was like, okay, look. <laughs> And of course I was 15, so it would be my parents buying him and, and everything else. So long story short there, um, we like toyed back and forth with getting him and keep in mind he was two. So did I really need a two year old as extremely inexperienced as I was? Absolutely not. Um, I really wish the chickens would stop screaming. I apologize. Um, Did not need a two-year-old at all, but here we were. So we toyed back and forth, whatever, and I had a horse show that weekend, and he was in Pennsylvania. I live in North Carolina. And um, in conversation, my parents told me that he had sold already, so like, don't worry about it. Um, you know, just get it off your mind, focus on the horse show, whatever. And so the next couple days went by, we went to the horse show, and my mom was like, hiding behind horse trailers, like sneaking around on her phone 
and just being really weird. And <laughs> we, came, we came home from the horse show that, sat, that Sunday. It was a weekend horse show. And my mom woke me up at like midnight. Of course, I passed out as soon as I got home. My mom woke me up at like midnight and she was like, hey, the barn owner needs us at the barn. There's a horse coming in and um, you know, she's not able to be there for some reason. Like looking back on it, it was such a bad lie. And <laughs> we get there and this trailer pulls up. <laughs> this trailer is like rocking back and forth. Like you'd think this guy had a dinosaur in there. Come to find out it's a dragon. Um, anyways, <laughs> so he, I mean, this trailer is busted up and he opens the door and he looks at me. I'm still Facebook friends with him to this day, the, the shipper. And he was so, so kind and he keeps up with us. And um, he opens the door, he looks at me. He's like, so this is your horse, right? And I'm like, no, like we're just here for the, for the barn owner. And my parents were like, shh, stop, like to the shipper. And he's like, oops, sorry. And he gets the horse off the trailer and it's Elliot. And of course I recognize him right away and I just start bawling and I think I have a video of that. Huh? Is that who I think Carolina? Meet Big Stinky. Megan. <laughs> <laughs> hey baby. You're okay. What do you think leave the light on? Come say hi. Hi, baby. Hey, Elliot. We purchased, my parents purchased this farm a month after, or like the same month we got Elliot. It was just crazy and then like, month later he came home so this is where things get a little sticky um I don't want to name names I don't want to say anything blatantly outright but I will just leave it at this my um his two-year-old year was a very very terrible experience for us both um we were under some guidance that just really did not work well for us um I'll leave it at that. Um, and I was, I was 15, I didn't know any better. And that's why I'm saying this because if you see that stuff on social media, your first instinct is to make a nasty comment or send it to your friends or bully the person into, into realizing what they're doing wrong. And I'm telling you, coming from the other side of it, it doesn't work. You can't, as soon as you say something mean, or post it on Horrible Horsemanship, or post it on, you know, all these sites that I got posted on, people, the first thing they're gonna do is get offended and push back and not be open to learning what they're doing wrong. It just comes with time and maturity and being exposed to different things in the horse world. You can't bully someone into correcting their behavior. So I'll leave it at that. Um, so some questionable, th questionable things were done. Um, we moved around instruction a little bit um, and finally, I was at a point where, like, this horse was just borderline dangerous, and, but I loved him. Like, for some reason, we just got along, and we were, like, best little friends, and, you know, we'd go to horse shows, and people were like, oh my god, like, look out for that one, it's a psychopath. I'm like, hi, hi, that's me and my horse, um, thank you, we're here to have a good time. Um, and then, anyways, so we started going to quarter horse shows, had no clue what we were doing whatsoever, but we were having a good time. Finally, I found my current trainer and I messaged her on Facebook and I was like, please help me. Um, my horse is a dragon, but you'll love him, I swear. We went in for a first lesson. I just remember the look on her face. She was like, okay, <laughs> but she helped me. Like she, she saw what Elliot and I had going on and she saw how much we loved each other and I told her what I wanted to do. I wanted to show all the big shows with him. I wanted to do everything. I wanted to do every little piece of the all around. I just, I just wanted it all. And I, I just loved this horse to death. So she did everything she could to help us. Um, and I think right before then, this is where my timeline gets a little messy. Um, Cause I, it's just all such a blur and I was so young. Um, 
so I think it was right before then is when Elliot went to, it might've been the same time, I don't know. Anyways, the first time we went to um, the vet school. And by vet school, I mean NC State Veterinary Hospital. Um, they're incredible. They are just above and beyond. Um, only good things to say about them. Um, so I was going to work one day. I had come home after high school or something and I was going to work and I came to check on the horses on the way out and um, I found Elliot in his stall. It was like a summer day or something. So he was in a stall under a fan and he was just having a complete meltdown. Like I'm talking drenched in sweat and it was like the evening and cool and he was under a fan. Like he should not have been drenched in sweat and he was in a stall, like he wasn't running around. Um, absolutely drenched in sweat and pawing and his whole body was trembling and he was just having a complete meltdown. And I called a vet, they came out, they said it was colic. And I was like, I, it just doesn't seem like colic to me. So they tubed him, nothing happened. So we ended up going up to the vet school. And he was at the vet school for probably two or three days. Um, and I kept, I had to keep working. I was braiding a horse show that weekend. Um, <clears throat> and it was horrible. I, I remember braiding and getting the phone call that, you know, he had some kind of neurologic issue. And I know I made a video before about what all, <clears throat> excuse me, went on that caused us to eventually retire him. But this is a little bit more of the honest version. So, which, and, and I don't even want to say honest version. It's just more of a understanding that I have now. Um, so we thought it was just, and like we did all the tests. I'm freezing sitting here. We did all the tests and did everything that we could to find out what the heck was going on. And the vet school basically said, I don't know. Um, but he does have, you know, a low count, but he does have Lyme's disease. He's testing positive for that. Um, he could possibly have PSSM. And looking back on it, we never actually tested for which type of PSSM he had. The vet school was just like, look, you start treating it now, or like not treating it, but like, you know, caring for him as if he has it. And we go off of if he does have it, or if the, he responds to the care properly, then just keep going. Like, there's your ticket. And so we just did that. And looking back on it, obviously, I wish I had tested him. Um, I literally, the week before he passed, called a vet and said, like, hey, can you just run this test for me? That aged well. Um, but so they, they did the PSSM and then they actually x-rayed his spine and found what they thought was a slight compression at C3. And C3 is up like by his skull, like in his neck. Um, so we were like, okay. And he was four at the time. So, and this was an incredibly active horse. He was a baby. Like he loved to work even granted like everything he had been for been through at that point. I don't, I don't know why he loved to work. I think he just loved to hang out with people anyways. And his favorite thing in the world, which makes more sense now was to just drag his nose in the dirt and go for these long stretchy trot rides and just stretch his little legs out. And so I was like, he's not, oh, also they said because of the spinal compression, he had some slight ataxia in the back end, which is just like, he wasn't quite tracking upright. It was a neurologic sign. So they said, take him home, you know, manage him. And we did all the stuff. We did chiropractic, we did, um, and keep in mind, this is different than kissing spine. So he didn't have kissing spine. He just, it was a little bit different. Um, and I'm not a vet, so I'm not gonna be the one to explain all the details of that, because I know I'll, I'll say something wrong. Um, anyways, but we did pulse therapy, we did chiropractic, we did absolutely everything that we could. So much like back on track therapy, everything that horse could have ever needed and was vet advised, we did. And so eventually under the guidance of my current trainer, he got so much stronger and 
just was killing it. Like he was doing fantastic. And so we ended up taking him to the Congress. Well, leading up to the Congress, his body was just like, I don't even know what to explain it. Like at this point I had just chalked it up to, it was just Elliot. He was crazy. I love him, but he's, he's a little bonkers. Um, but like, you'd be going around the pen. He'd be totally fine, killing it, throwing his little legs out there. And he would just come unglued. And like, like my trainer explains it. She, I had Elliot in training with her the month before the Congress. And she was like, so she was riding him consistently. And, um, like she said, it was just like, you'd be going along and you say, okay, we're gonna turn right now. And he would just come up and grow his dragon wings and just like lose it. And it was scary, okay? Like it was, he was not a big horse. He was probably like 16 one, but it was scary. Like he got big real quick. And for some reason I wasn't scared of him. Like I was like, obviously I was worried why he was doing that, but I thought he was just being Elliot. And like, he didn't have the greatest start under saddle. So I was like, okay this is just trauma from his past. And that's what my trainer thought too, because we traded, I mean, everything we thought we could treat, ulcers, you know, any sort of pain in his body, any, any symptoms and signs he showed us, we answered it with how you would normally get results for pain treatment or whatever. And it just like, sometimes it would work and sometimes it'd go away for a while and then it'd just come back randomly. It was just very, very strange and no vet, no one had answers for us. And now we know why, but. Anyways, so we took him to the Congress and um, he was fine. Like he was totally fine schooling. Everything was fine. He was doing great. And then I'd go in a hunter on her saddle class and he was going around and I don't remember exactly what triggered it, but he just lost it. Like he started bronking and like throwing his head and just like you like having a meltdown and I had to I had to stop him I had to walk in the rest of the class like a great first congress and I just remember if you've ever been to the congress you know what I'm talking about but like I just remember walking through the grounds and I found the laundromat and I just sat behind that big brick building and I just sobbed because I knew I knew this horse could not go any further um I, I couldn't push him any further i as much as I wanted to see the world with him and experience absolutely everything with him, his body was not cooperating with what he and I wanted to do. So we came home and we said, okay, I talked to my vet and he said, put him out to pasture, let him mature a little bit. I think he was five at this point. Uh, I don't know. Um, he might've been going into his five-year-old year. Um, he said, put him out to pasture, see how he matures. Maybe his spine issue will, you know, develop a little bit differently and he'll be fine in a couple years. So put him out to pasture and, you know, did a couple things with him here and there um, as he got increasingly bored. Um, but, and worked him a little bit and just to see how he was. And he has some on and off lameness issues, um, which where it came from, nobody knows. Um, but then about, two years ago maybe a year ago he was just getting so so bored and he'd stand by the round pen and just watch like if I was lunging a horse or riding a horse in there or whatever he would just watch the horse going around like anything I was doing he would just watch me and he would sit there and paw at the round pen fence and then I'd do it finish whatever I was doing and I'd grab him and I'd put him in the round pen and he would just bolt around having the greatest time celebrate and then he'd slam on brakes and look at me and be like okay thank you <laughs> like I just I don't know like I just knew what that horse was trying to tell me and it's it's a crazy crazy feeling um which is why I call him my heart horse and I just understood everything he was saying me saying to me and um anyways so I started riding him a little bit and he was sound and he was doing great. And his weirdest thing was like when I started, most of his, his triggers when he was younger and we were showing him um, was in the canner. Like something would just twinge wrong in the canner and he would blow up. And then when I started bringing him back, all he wanted to do was canner. Like you take a couple trot steps and just be like doing a slow jog and he would just very slowly and pretty, but he would just lope off like out of nowhere. and. Like he just want to lope the entire time. And it was just really weird for him. And 
but he was sound, he wasn't showing any signs of pain. So I was like, you know what? If it makes you happy, do, do whatever. I'll just lope you around, like, you're fine. And he was thrilled. Like he calmed down a lot, he got a lot happier. Um, and then, and, and this is all looking back on it. Um, and I'm saying this because even if I had seen it in a different light and tried to diagnose it it's not something that could have been diagnosed while he was alive and that is what the vet told us in his case and I have to listen to her because she literally did everything on him so he started doing some really weird things within the past like two years or so um a lot of teeth grinding um which can be a sign of pain which but it was also just like, he was just freaking weird. And I'm sure he's just freaking weird. Like I can't even describe it unless you met Elliot. He was just freaking weird. Um, anyways, and so like this years ago, this was probably when he was a little itty bitty baby, like a dummy head, I tied him to one of these bars. I like hard tied him. And he had an issue with pulling back. I wonder why. Um, and so he pulled out this, this bar like there's supposed to be a bar right here right like one of these metal bars and he pulled it out well from that point forward he thought it was the funniest thing and he would never stick his head through the actual window or anything else and like even out these stalls are run-ins so even when he was retired and out to pasture he would hang out in his stall all day like that's all he just wanted to be a little show horse again and it was just the funniest thing anyways so he would stick his head through this self-made window and anytime I came into the barn, he would always be there and he'd always nicker at me every single time I walked in. But he started, and I'm sure I have some pictures and videos of it. Um, but he started like pressing his, his neck and his jaw, like kind of like where his neck and his jaw meet, he would press it down really, really hard on this, um, what's it called, ledge, I guess. Um, oh, and that's why his halter's here because he was the only horse that ever did it. And he would, he was literally there all the time. Like no other horse ever stuck their head through this little window. So that's there anyways. Um, but he started doing that and like pressing really hard and it was like, he was choking himself out. And I did actually, he was doing it when I had a vet out here and I was like, what, what does that look like to you? And she was like, it's probably like a stress response. Um, kind of like cribbing. And I was like, okay, like I have a cribber that makes sense. Like he normally does it as a you know, happiness response, or he just does it all the time, I don't know, so I was like, okay, you know, weird, but fitting, and he would do it, I just kind of chalked it up to, like, his version of cribbing, and, yeah, so many weird things, and, like, yeah, so, I was literally, I, I, I took him, he hadn't been anywhere since 2017, um, when we brought him home from the Congress, I took him to, like, one show, Congress is in October. I, I took him to one show in December to just do showmanship. And he loved it. And um, he hadn't been anywhere since. And so I took him to a horse show just to ride around um, this past summer. He loved it. He was so quiet, which was weird because I'm normally like, yeah, sorry, this is my dragon. Everybody watch out. <laughs> but he always did everything safely. Like he'd, he'd flail around and he'd make you fear for your life. But like, I never actually felt like I was gonna die, you know? Anyway, um, his favorite thing to do was spin. Anytime he got scared or anything else or spooked, he would spin. And I do have a video of that recently. Anyway, so, um, so yeah, we got, we got to do a couple fun, fun things and he became a really, really fun trail horse, um, the past couple of months. And he just... He would just light up when I took him on a trail and he wasn't spooky. He was just fantastic. And I'm, I'm really, I'm really glad we got to do those things and enjoy those things together um, this past year. Cause I certainly did not think it was going to be our last year together. Um, so here's the fun part. Um, not fun. Not at all, actually. Um, Nemo, why do you have a tennis ball? <laughs> he chooses the worst times to play. Um, but he does know how to cheer me up, that's for sure. Um, so, on January 31st, he ate his breakfast. Um, everything was normal. 
while they were eating their breakfast. Um, I put a round bail out and that's his favorite thing. I took a video of him waiting to be turned out after he watched me put the round bail out. And I turned him out and he did his little celebration, his weird little sideways head flinging run to the round bale. He always had to be the first one to the round bale. Um, first one everywhere. All the horses would wait back in the pasture until he got in his stall to eat and then they'd all come up. He was such a jerk. <laughs> he'd rip everybody's blankets. He'd terrorize everybody. Um, yeah, he was, he was a force to be reckoned with. Um, anyway, so I, I put the round bale out and I went about my business and I, I didn't get to ride him that day. Um, it was on my plan. It was, he was on my list. I was going to ride him because, um, you know, he was just on my on my list that day, and he had been riding so great lately, and I really wanted to get some muscle back on him, um, but I didn't, and I'm glad I didn't, um, because knowing what I know now, it might have, something might have happened during the ride, and anyways, so everything was fine throughout the day, I kept an eye on him, and then about one o'clock, I came to the barn to ride the other horses and I noticed he was laying flat in the pasture and I made a joke to my friend that was in the barn. I was like, oh my gosh, like that horse loves giving me heart attacks. And I mean, he loves to sunbathe. It was a beautiful day. So I didn't think too much of it, but I was kind of like, it's a little weird that he's flat and he was right by the round bale. And normally he lays by himself, not around the other horses. And then he came running full speed. Like you'd think he was a herd of horse being, horses being chased by a lion up to the barn. And he laid down in front of the barn. And I was like, that's weird. He never lays down twice. And why is he sprinting around? And then he got up and did it again. He made a full lap around the pasture. But this time he came in the run-in stalls and laid down. And he wasn't rolling or anything else, he was just laying down and then he'd lay down flat. And at this point, and he, anytime he ever laid down in the stall, which was very, very rare, it was always in his stall. He never, ever, ever laid down in another horse's stall. But he was in the last stall, which is not his. So, of course, I went to sit with him and just kind of like look him over and his eyes were bloodshot, like popping out of his head, his nostrils flaring. He was panicking um, and like running from something. And um, so he got up and he just walked outside the stall and he laid down again. I didn't know if he was having, like it was not typical colic. It was really weird that he was running and sprinting around, not rolling. Nothing like that, just very, very, very strange. So then my second guess was that he was having a PSSM episode. And that's a muscle disorder, essentially. So it attacks the muscles um, and it basically makes the muscles like seize up. And I'm, I'm not gonna explain it all here, but it's, it's a pretty simple thing to, to look up and find lots of information on if you're curious. Um, and it is a genetic, most of the time, yeah, I think it's always genetic. Um, anyway. Um, so I wasn't sure if he was having a PSSM episode or a colic or what the heck was going on. And so I was trying to get a hold of any vet, anybody that I could get in contact with to ask if I should give Banami. Because obviously that's my first instinct if a horse is colicking, but I wasn't sure. He hadn't had an episode since he was two, the first time we took him to the vet school. So I was calling around, panicking, trying to trying to get somebody to give me the okay to put banamine in him. Finally got a vet and she said, yes, give him the banamine. Um, and no vet was able to come out. Everybody was like on the other side of the state. And she said, give him the banamine and call me back in an hour and tell me how he is. So I gave him the banamine. And while I was walking him, he just kept trying to lay down. And it was really, really not like him at all. I gave him the Benjamin, he calmed down a lot. Um, so I thought I was on the other side of it. And if you watched my my Instagram 
um, stories, you'd know that I thought, I thought we were in the clear. Um, like he just calmed down a lot. He was standing in the barn, leg rested, everything was fine. 30 minutes went by and he blew through the band of me, um, which is not normal. Um, and he started laying down again, running in the pasture and just panicking. So I called and I was about to leave for dinner because I thought we were in the clear and I was supposed to have dinner with my boyfriend's parents that night. And I was like, I can't leave. I just, something's wrong. This is not, this is not Elliot. And so I called the vet back again and I said, hey, he's not doing so good. Um, and she called me and she said, she asked me some more details and she said, look, I can be there within an hour, but if he blew through the band of me that quickly, I think you need to get him to state because, you know, I don't have the equipment to be able to help with something this severe on my truck. And if we wait for me to get there just to tell you to go to state, it's time wasted that we can't waste. So of course I start bawling and I load up the trailer. And one time he did not want to get on the trailer. He has always, always, always loaded. He did not want to get on that trailer. And he was thrashing all the way to the vet school. Um, and of course, the one time my 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 trailer camera wasn't work, so I couldn't well, wasn't working, so I couldn't watch him in the trailer. So that was wonderful. Um, my mom came with me, bless her. She knows I can't do something like that alone. So we explain what's going on, and they they when we get to state, we explain what's going on. And we called ahead and explained a little bit. And they have his record from last time he was there, when he was two. So they pull that up and they're talking about it and how weird it is. And she's like, look, you know, I might not have any information for you, but we can get you some like pre preliminary findings within the hour. I said, okay. So we went, ran to the gas station, whatever, came back. And she came out and this vet was amazing. I mean, just so easy to get along with and so kind and thoughtful towards Elliot. And I, I can't explain how much I appreciate her. Um, anyway, so she comes out with her team and she says, it looks like there's an impaction of some kind. And, you know, we have him on everything he needs to be on. And she and we went ahead and had that really hard conversation because right when we walked in the door, it was $1,500. And when Elliot originally went to the vet school the first time, they, the insurance company dropped him. I have insurance on all my horses. Um, but the insurance company dropped him and because he, I mean, with all the issues he was having, he was just not insurable. So, of course, that meant we didn't have colic insurance on him. And I told the vet that, and I was like, look, I'm willing to do whatever I can to save this horse. I, I owe him absolutely everything. But she is actually the one that told me he's not a candidate for surgery if it gets to that point because of the neurologic issues. Because he does have that history of ataxia and neurologic symptoms. If we were to put him through surgery, waking up from the anesthesia could very well kill him. It would be so incredibly dangerous. It's not a good enough chance to put him through the surgery. And so she said, I said, do what you need to do. Um, just, you know, get him through this. And she said, I have a good feeling if it's just an impaction, it's not that bad. Um, you know, it's, it should be fine. It's in a, a pretty good spot that we should be able to pass it. But she also had that really hard conversation with me. So she was very frank about everything. I just honestly don't remember a lot of it. Um, and my boyfriend came up to the vet school to sit with me and, and listen to it all. And he remembers more of those de details because I was just sobbing. Um, and I just knew, I knew in that moment I was gonna lose him. Um, I can't tell you how, I can't tell you why. I just knew I wasn't gonna be bringing him home. Um, and, uh, so she told me, she said, we'll go ahead and see if we can get him through the night and we should know 
by morning if he's gonna make it or not. And um, and she said, you know, if, if we're gonna see the other side of it, we'll see it by morning, if the medications are working and helping and everything else. Of course, I didn't sleep that night. Um, and I got home and got a call about three o'clock in the morning um, from the vet. And she said, Oops, I don't know what that was. Come here, Nemo. She said, hey, um, your boy's in a lot of pain um, and he's not even staying under sedation safely or comfortably for an hour. You know, he's blowing past everything we give him and just becoming dangerously in pain. And she said, I think it's time to let him go. And um, so I, of course I said, okay, you know, I don't want to put him in pain any longer. Can you make him comfortable enough for me at least to come say goodbye? And she said, how soon can you get here? I said, 30 minutes. And, she, and then I'm on my way. And um, she said, okay, we can try. And um, my boyfriend was kind enough to drive me up there at three o'clock in the morning when he had to be up for work at five o'clock. Um, and I called my mom and she answered right away, which she's a heavy sleeper, so I don't know how she did that. And um, and she was she was kind to call the vet school back and say, and you know, talk details with them about giving clearance for the necropsy and, and cremation details and everything else because I just couldn't have that conversation um, at that time. So we got there and um, yeah, that was awful. That was terrible. Um, he was laying curled up, obviously heavy, heavily sedated. He was curled up in a really weird position. Um, you know, you could just tell his body was just not comfortable, not there, just, ooh. Um, my boyfriend took a, a final picture of us, which I posted a few times because it just makes me cry <laughs> every time I look at it. Um, but they were so kind. They they cut off a bit of a bit of his mane and cut his tail off for me and gave it to me and gave me his halter back and and um they were just so so kind um and we said our goodbyes and we went home and um yeah so like i said um when i Donate or when I first when Elliot started when Elliot first started having all these issues, I promised him I would do absolutely everything in my power to help him and learn what I could do to help him. Even if it wasn't much, I devoted my entire life to making him comfortable, even as a pasture ornament. He was the prettiest pasture ornament. He was that bright, shiny red and Anyway, um, not gonna cry, not gonna cry. <sighs> I'm probably gonna cry when I stop this video. Um, anyway, um, so, <laughs> so I promised him I would do that and I knew immediately when we first started talking about options, when we first brought him to the vet school this time, that I wanted to donate him to the school um, I've seen a lot of really great vets come out of the NC State Vet School, and it's a great program. Um, and I didn't want Elliot to have, not no reason in his death, but to pass without teaching us one final lesson. Because uh, that horse was tough as nails. Tough as nails. But I didn't know, I didn't realize just how tough he was 
and I wanted to understand. And of course, you know, I run a boarding facility, so I explained to the vets, I was like, look, I've got 20 other horses I'm responsible for. I wanna know what I can change about my care program that either could have prevented this or helped us seen it sooner or, or something. I just, I want something to learn from. And um, so she emailed me yesterday, yesterday, the day before, I don't know, um, the necropsy results, the pre preliminary re necropsy, <laughs> preliminary necropsy results. And by preliminary, we mean we're still waiting on a couple other, you know, tissue samples and like lab tests to come through, but, um, got the big stuff and what they found was not at all what anyone saw coming but i'll just cut to the point so we thought he had a spinal compression in c3 told you that guy told you that already but what we didn't know was that he had severely advanced arthritic growth in his neck at c3 c4 c5 and c6 and I don't know, there's lots to be learned about arthritis and, and what comes with that, but basically it's a lot of extra bony growth where there shouldn't be. And there was so much bony growth that it was pressing on his spinal cord. And that is most likely um, what was causing the random explosions. Like he could have been going along just fine and maybe he moved his neck just wrong and it twinged in just the wrong way and, and hurt. And obviously, I mean, had I known it was a, a pain response, I mean, granted, there was nothing, it was so far advanced, there was nothing to do about it. And yeah, um, I mean, he was even, and I, I guess that is some kind of, some kind of piece that, you know, all those weird things he was doing, like hanging his head on the, on the ledge and all that stuff, it was probably a pain response. So the fact that he was even in pain in the pasture um, brought a little bit of peace to his passing, knowing that we were able to help him go peacefully um, and under heavy sedation. <laughs> um, but that wasn't the big ticket item. So like I said, um, they thought they found an impaction, but it was just a little bit weird. And, you know, they thought it was going to pass through and you know, just things started declining rapidly and no one knew why, and it was just, it just got out of control very quickly. Um, well, the reason it wasn't passing was because um, it wasn't actually like a hay impaction or anything like that. Um, he actually had a massive cancerous tumor um, where his stomach emptied. And I guess it had eventually just, gotten so big that nothing could get past it um, and that was causing the extreme abdominal pain that he was experiencing and what he was trying he was trying to run away from that pain in the pasture when he was running that day um, and that's why he was trying to lay down to get away from the pain I'm thinking now maybe that was why he was such a, a weird horse to keep weight and muscle on. Like maybe it was draining him somehow. Um, yeah, it, it answers a lot of questions, but it, it leaves a lot of questions to be had still. Um, and that was really, really hard to hear. Because as, as much as it did bring me some peace and closure that we did the right thing, I'm just in shock that that horse could have been in that much pain and still wanted to hang out and work and it was just so happy-go-lucky all the time. I have no words. I, he was just incredible. Absolutely incredible. Um, and I owe him everything. I mean, I, I owe him my how my brain works how my heart works how my soul works i owe him everything i mean he he raised email there's nothing there 
He raised me as a person while I was raising him as a baby horse. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. So, I left the vet school with a $2,500 bill and his hair. And, um, and I am pick, I'm waiting to get the call to go pick up his, um, cremated remains. We got his hooves and his heart cremated, um, which I thought was a really, really sweet thing that they offer. And I'm still not really sure if I want to spread some of them somewhere. I was thinking maybe of like planting a tree and maybe spreading them there. Um, I don't think I'm going to be able to open the box for a really long time. But um, I think it might be something I want to do eventually. Because um, I do like having like constant reminders, like his little shrine here. Because he, he's been here as long as, as we've had this farm. And this is home. And it's... He's always terrorized this place. And it's really weird without him. It's too quiet. There's no horses thundering around in the pasture squealing making all sorts of he would every single morning i'd walk in the barn he'd come storming in his stall and start grinding his teeth on the wall and i hated it i hated it it was so annoying but now i miss it i really miss it a lot so i'm going to get when i brought him home from the congress in 2017 i i went and got a dragon tattooed on my ankle and I used to I used to think it was my least favorite tattoo I've and because my dad specifically would make fun of me every single day because it looks like a bat and um I can't show you guys now because it's under like six layers of clothes but I'm going to get it altered on Saturday to actually look like a dragon in his honor and finish it out. Um, but yeah, I still haven't moved his blanket. I still haven't done a lot of things. I did get a really sweet package in the mail the other day. Um, I'll mention them in my description, but a friend of mine sent me a, a crocheted version of Elliot and it's the perfect color. The markings are perfect. So I feel like I'm at a point now in my grieving that I can celebrate him and memorialize him and I'm still making probably too many TikTok and YouTube posts about him and making myself cry but that's just I don't ever want to lose the pictures and videos of him so I'm going through and I'm finding ones that I didn't even know I had and um, finding new things to do with his hair and just keep him close as possible because um, I know he always wanted to be as close as close to me as possible. Every time I'd be riding a horse in the arena, he'd be standing on the hill watching me. Didn't leave me for a second. Um, I've just been keeping myself busy with the other horses and, and learning new things and coping along the way. Um, but I am gonna wrap this up because I see my time is getting at almost an hour um, that I've been sitting here and my toes are cold. But um, I do wanna say thank you for being so kind through my grieving process. And I know a lot of you are grieving too. Um, like I said, you've, you've been here through it all with me. And I've, I've gotten a lot of sweet messages of things that Elliot inspired and it means a lot to me. Um, knowing that he touched so many lives when many people were afraid of him. <laughs> and I'm still in touch with the lady that we got him from and um, the lady that has his mom and, you know, all the important people that were involved in his life and it really hit hard. So anyways, I'm going to wrap that up cause I'm freezing, but if you watch this whole thing, I really appreciate you. Um, and here's to Elliot. <laughs>